Hello, and welcome to Mormons, Mystics, and Muons. Uh, today, I want to talk about um, just something interesting I had come across a few weeks ago. I, I'm i not that familiar with Grant Palmer. Um, I listened to a bit of his Mormon Stories episode, but I haven't read his book. But my understanding is that um, he kind of talks about the mystical interpretation of Joseph Smith and the history of the church and, um, talks about spiritual eyes and the witnesses. Um, but apparently he had claimed to have talked to a current 70 who he claimed was, um, kind of his informant, um, but anyway, there's some, so in 2020, John DeLynn, who had interviewed Grant Palmer, um, a few times, um, John DeLynn, you know, this is after Grant Palmer had passed, had come out and revealed that the general authority that Grant Palmer, that was Grant Palmer's supposed informant was F. Enzio Boucher. And then I guess, um, after a couple days, um, whether, whether Boucher's daughter, one place I saw that she had threatened to sue him, um, or another place, maybe there was concerns about Boucher's widow still receiving, um, the pension from the church. Anyway, Dillon had taken down the post uh, outing Boucher as the um, supposed informant. Um, but, but I guess it still became public knowledge and there's a couple Reddit posts about it. Uh, as I was looking th through these posts, um, I found out some accounts of, I guess, some interesting beliefs that Boucher had which very much aligned with kind of a more spiritual new age, um, cosmology. And so, so this is kind of the, I just find it fascinating. Uh, and I haven't seen anybody else kind of report on this or put this together. Um, so I want to read through a few posts and, and just put this out there. So this was the Mormon stories podcast. So this is Dylan's post. I think a few days after he had outed, uh, Boucher as the informant, supposed informant. Uh, this is a post on Facebook saying, for those who want or need a refresher, these are the claims that Grant Palmer made about his meetings with the Emeritus Mormon General Authority. He met who lost his faith, whom I discussed the name of a few days back after receiving independent confirmation from four independent sources. Out of respect for his family's concerns about his widow, whose income is still unfortunately tied to the church, I have taken down my post and I'll not use his name for now, but I 100% stand by my sources and reporting. And I'll clearly state my motive. If a general authority loses his faith and his family knows it, I believe that he and his family owe it to Mormonism to tell us the truth, like Hans and Birgitta Matson so courageously did to much sacrifice of comfort in their part. The Mormon church requires far too much time, money, and obedience of its members. It literally claims to speak for God and harms far too many people women, LGBTQ individuals, people of color, youth, thinking members, families, that it is not okay for a general authority's family to know that the general authority lost his faith and to keep that quiet forever. People are dying. Families are being destroyed weekly. I and others like Natasha Parker and Margie spend our lives picking up the pieces of the fractured lives that are reeling in response to the false truth claims of Mormonism perpetuated primarily through Mormon general authorities science's complicity in the carnage. And then he links to a post on um, the Journal of Loyal Descent from 2013 um, that I'm going to read. So this is Grant Palmer, who this page describes him as a renowned LDS historian and author of An Insider's View of Mormon Origins. So this is written by Grant Palmer. It's three title three meetings with a, with a LDS general authority in 2012 to 2013. 
in mid-October 2012, a returned LDS mission president contacted me to arrange a meeting. Several days earlier, he called again and said that a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy also wished to attend. He said the general authority would attend on condition that I not name him or repeat any stories that would identify him. He explained that neither of them, including the GA's wife, believed the founding claims of the restoration were true. He clarified that they had read my book, An Insider's View of Mormon Origins, and had concluded that the LDS Church was not true, was not what it claimed to be. The GA often went to mormonthink.com website for information and there discovered my book. The mission president said he received my book from the general authority. We have at this writing met three times. We first met on Tuesday, October 23rd, 2012, and again, February 14th, 2013 at my house. On March 26th, 2013, we convened at the general authority's house. Upon entering my home for the first meeting, the general authority said, we are here to learn. I recognized him. He has been a member of the first quorum of the 70 for a number of years. He has served in several high profile assignments during this period. The following are the more important statements made by the general authority during our first three meetings. We now meet monthly. He said that each new member of the quorum of the 12 apostles is given $1 million to take care of any financial obligation that they have. This money gift allows them to fully focus on the ministry. He said that the overriding consideration of who is chosen is whether they are quote unquote church broke, meaning will they do whatever they are told. He said the senior six apostles make the agenda and do most of the talking. The junior six are told to observe, listen, and learn, and really only comment if they are asked. He said that it takes about two or three years before the new apostle discovers that the church is not true. He said it took Dieter Uchtdorf a little longer because he was an outsider. He said they privately talk among themselves and know the foundational claims of the restoration are not true, but continue on boldly, quote unquote, because the people need it, meaning the people need the church. When the mission president voiced skepticism and named blank as one who surely did believe, the general authority said, no, he doesn't. The $1 million gift plus their totally obedient attitude makes it easy for them to go along when they find out the church is not true. For these reasons and others, he doesn't expect any apostle to ever expose the truth about the foundational claims. When I asked the general authority how he knew these things, he answered by saying that the Quorum of the Twelve today is more isolated than the quorums of the 70s now because there are several of them. When only one quorum of the 70 existed, there was more intimacy. During his one-on-one -on -one assignments with an apostle, conversations were more familiar. He said that none of the apostles ever said to him directly that they did not believe, but that this was his opinion based on, quote, my interactions with them, end quote. Also, that none of the 12 want to dis discuss, quote, unquote, truth issues, meaning issues regarding the foundational claims of the church. He said that the apostles' lives are so completely and entirely enmeshed in every detail of their lives in the church that many of them would probably defy, die defending the church rather than admit the truth about Joseph Smith and the foundations of the church. The general authority stated that my disciplinary, disciplinary action, which would have occurred on the final Sunday of October 2010, had I not resigned, was mandated, ordered, approved by the First Presidency of the Church. I said that if the, if the apostles know the church is not true, and yet order a disciplinary hearing for my writing a book that is almost certainly true regarding the foundational claims of the church, then they are corrupt, even evil. He replied, that's right. The general authority said the church is like a weakened dam. At first, you don't see cracks in the face. Nevertheless, things are happening behind the scenes. Eventually, small cracks appear, and then the dam will explode. When it does, he said, the members are going to be shocked and will need scholars and historians like me to educate them regarding the Mormon past. The mission president and the general authority both said they attend church every Sunday and feel like, quote, a hypocrite and trapped, end quote. The general authority said his war treats him like a king. And when he gives firesides and speaks to LDS congregations, they have high expectations of him. He would like to do more in getting the truth out besides raising a few questions when speaking and gifting my book to others when feeling comfortable. Perhaps this is why he has reached out to me. The general authority is a man of integrity and very loving. Upon leaving each time, he always gives me a big hug. So that was a, a written piece by Grant Palmer about his meetings in 2012, 2013, and that was posted in 2013. So I imagine that was written in, um, 2013. Um, so, so yeah, in 2020 is when 
John DeLynn, you know, after both uh, Elder Boucher and Grant Palmer had passed away, that's when John DeLynn came forward and outed uh, Enzio Boucher as the quote unquote informant. Um, but then interestingly enough, there's another side of the story um, by this. This was the fascinating uh, part of the story that I haven't heard people talk about. Um, so four years ago, so this would have been before um, I know this, this was right after the, the outing. So somebody posted on Reddit saying that John Dillon had just said that the general authority who spoke to Grant Palmer was F. Enzio Boucher. And so a Redditor, I'm the Marmot King, uh, had an interesting post. He said, some of you are aware that I met with Palmer's general authority a few years ago. I encourage everyone to review those comments I wrote here. And then he linked to a, another post, which I will read next. But then he goes on, he goes on and says, uh, I'm not sure I agree with the Lynn's decision to out him, but I can confirm that Elder Boucher is the general authority that Grant Palmer met with multiple times, but I am not one of Dillon's sources. If you read my previous comments, you will learn that he disputed much of what Palmer said about those meetings. I was light on details because I didn't want to out him. Now that his identity is known, I can share a few more details. In particular, I mentioned that Elder Boucher is not the hidden exmo Grant portrays him as, even though it's true he doesn't believe in hardly any of the church's truth claims. Part of the reason this is the case is that Elder Boucher never really bought into most of the church's truth claims. For example, he, he told me that he only got baptized as a young man in Germany on the condition that he didn't have to believe in the Old Testament because, and I quote, quote, Jehovah is a mass murderer, end quote. He also claims the missionaries were upfront that Joseph was an adulterer. In short, he never got baptized on the conviction of the restoration. He got baptized because of the enormous love he felt from the missionaries, a kind of love he feels is pretty much absent from church leaders now. He spoke glowingly about David O. McKay, but said the modern apostles don't know Jesus Christ. I asked him if he ever bore testimony of Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon, and he kind of hemmed and hawed and said maybe he did, but he never really cared about any of that. And this is the part. Uh, this is part of the reason I said he's not an exmo the way we are. I believe this detail alters the tenor of Palmer's piece quite a bit. Another detail, which I'm going to be vague about out of respect is that when I met, met Elder Boucher, he had moved on to some pretty outlandish beliefs, more outlandish than Mormonism, more outlandish than 9-11 truth or conspiracies. He spent about an hour of our three hours talking about these beliefs. An example of one of his less bizarre beliefs is that Joseph Smith, Jesus Christ, and others are, quote, ascended masters, unquote, to give you an idea of where he was at. Boucher is a fascinating individual, but he is not a smoking gun that the church leadership is secretly run by closet non-believers with million dollar slush funds. He was, by my own admission, a general authority that never quite fit in, that was distrusted by others because of his outsider status, and that never really believed in the core tenets of the restoration the way we did. It was always about pursuing godlike love for him. He felt like the LDS church was the best place to do that half a century ago, but isn't anymore. And then a couple other comments. Um, Joseph Humbert Humbert asked, do you know if he had his second anointing? Because that would be very interesting to have a non-believer receive the golden ticket. And the Marmot King responded, yes, he has. I asked him about it and he kind of laughed it off as a silly thing. And Seven Places asked, curious if he asked you to keep the discussion confidential or knew he was spilling the beans. He told multiple people, it seems so not a big secret. And the Marmot King said, yes, he wanted it to stay confidential and was annoyed at how much Grant had revealed. I agree that it wasn't that big of a secret, though. Several people knew, and he was extremely open with me, even though I was a stranger. Um, other interesting posts here. Somebody said, uh, John Phantom Hive said, ah, so he's a theosophist and all that's pretty interesting to hear. Honestly, I'm the Marmot King. 
said, I had never heard of Ascended Masters before meeting with him. And although I Googled it a bit after the fact, I can never get through much material on it. So Theosophy is essentially um, kind of new age beliefs. I don't know that it's strictly, it's not necessarily a religion, um, but it's, you know, it talks about Akashic Records and um, Ascended Masters. Uh, but, I, but I think a lot of like the beliefs that fall under Theosophy are float around kind of new age or spiritual beliefs um, somewhat somewhat literally literally to to some but I think more symbolically to others um, and so somebody commented and said that the ascended master belief is similar to the Baha'i concept of manifestations of God um, which is interesting on my mission, I remember meeting uh, somebody and, and, and saying, you know, talk about jo Joseph Smith. And he was like, oh, yeah, I believe Joseph Smith is a, a prophet, um, just like all these other people. Um, and they were Baha'i. Uh, and Baha'i is a fairly mm, new agey religion. I mean, it still ta talks of a specific concept of a God, but, it, but it's pretty similar to like new age and spiritual uh, beliefs. Um, so somebody else asked, did he confirm any of the non-theological claims like general authorities getting all of their debts paid off and a large financial incentive to not deny the faith? I'm the Marmot King said, I addressed this in the previous comment of mine I linked, but he stated that those were just rumors he had heard as a general authority and not necessarily reflective of his own opinion. Palmer makes it sound like, uh, sound much more substantiated. I confronted Gar Grant Palmer about some of the discrepancies via email. This was only about a week before Palmer died. He was rather brusque about it and only answered, Elder Boucher has either forgotten the content of those meetings or just, or doesn't want to own it. So that's the extent from that post. And then the, the previous post, so this was six years ago. So this was a few years before Boucher was outed. And this is um, a comment by I'm the Marmot King on, on another Reddit post. And so he said, it's hard to give too many details since I don't want to out him referring to the general authority. Here's my summary though. After close to two years of searching and talking to several people in the know, I got enough information to deduce who it was, who it is. I was confident enough that I sent him a long typewritten letter with some personal pictures explaining why I was looking for him and all that. A couple weeks later, I got a voicemail from him congratulating me for finding him. I called him back later and we spoke on the phone for a bit and he told me his story. Several months later, I knew I was going to be near him, so I gave him a phone call and asked to meet. He agreed, although he didn't remember me anymore by this time. I gathered I'm not the only person that has come knocking on his door. I sat with him for about three hours. He told me interesting stories about his life, among other things. When I brought up Grant Palmer's document, he told me he was misrepresented on many details. He didn't seem to remember much, though. I, remember, I read him several passages from Grant's piece, and sometimes it was like he was hearing it for the first time. In fact, he only seemed vaguely aware of all the talk about him. I truly don't think he is very aware at all about the Exmo world, so to speak, other than that he knows people are waking up. I told him about some of the things Grant said on Dylan's podcast. He had no idea what that was. A few of the things he content contested. One, that the brethren don't believe that they get a million dollar gift, etc. He said this was not his opinion, but just some rumors he had heard while a general authority. Two, Elder Uchtdorf taking longer than most apostles do to discover it's not true. He reacted as if he'd never heard this passage before, looked taken aback, and said he'd never say that. Three, that he was deconverted by reading Grant's books and gifts it to other people. The 70 claimed he only read a few pages of it and didn't particularly like it. In fact, I think he said he threw it away. He said he rebuked Grant once for trying to tear down the church. There are other things as well, but I'm trying to be very conservative here and not give away too much. Overall, Grant gave off a vibe of having a much closer connection to this guy than he really did. I met with the 70 not long after Grant's last appearance in Morning Stories, which was right after Hamula's excommunication. 
In that interview, Grant stated that his 70 had told him that he had he met with Hamula on a specific day that he named, and he learned he was exed over adultery. That annoyed me since that information is so specific that it would effectively out the 70, since Hamula could have only met with so many 70s in one day, but it was a live podcast and couldn't be edited out. So when I spoke to the 70, I assumed he'd have heard about this already and be outraged. Nope. Contrary to what Grant claimed, the 70 hadn't spoken with Grant in months. It turned out Grant learned this through an intermediary. I know this intermediary because I have spoken with him before and Grant specifically named him in an email to me, which I'll get to later. So that's the one instance in which I can verify that Grant exaggerated his closeness with the 70. There's a bunch of other stuff I learned that is extremely relevant and would significantly change the tenor of Grant's promise piece, but I can't get into it without endangering his anonymity. But I think it's important to note that this 70 isn't really the closeted Exmo hiding in the wings reading the Exmo Reddit and Mormon think and sacredly trying to get people to leave the church. It's true that he doesn't believe in most of the truth claims of the church, but our similarities with the 70 don't extend much further than that, in my opinion. He doesn't live in our world. I would say the odds of him doing an ask me anything or something are effectively zero. So I emailed Grant Palmer. I think this was only a couple weeks before he died and confronted him about a bunch of the discrepancies. I tried to be polite. Grant was short with me, didn't answer most of my questions, and intimated that the 70 was either not telling the truth or had forgotten the contents of their meetings. He referred me to a third party that was in those meetings. This is the person I mentioned earlier that was the go-between and revealed the Hemula stuff to Grant. But that third party was only in the later meetings and not the original one where the 70 supposedly said all the really crazy stuff about the brother not believing. I didn't want to bother Grant too much considering he was on his deathbed, so I dropped it. The third party has also told me that both he and the 70 were aghast at how many details were in Grant's original piece about meeting with the 70, which contradicts Grant's claim to me that the 70 had read through it and given his blessing before it was published. It's possible the 70 is the one being dishonest or forgetful, but my interactions with Grant have led me to believe he wasn't very careful with details and prone to exaggeration. The Hamula thing in particular rubbed me the wrong way, and that was verifiable that he didn't actually speak to the 70 himself about that. Bottom line, there's not much more to learn from the 70 that we don't already know. I got the impression he has a few stories about general authorities he thinks are jerks, but he's super into positivity and not speaking ill of others. And I only got to him to spill tea uh, I only got him to spill tea on one general authority he thought was an opportunistic ladder climber. He spilled tea on another, but he wouldn't give me a name. So other than, than the fact that the seven that there's a 70 out there that doesn't believe, there's not much left to squeeze out of that rock. Uh, so I just found that was a fascinating, particularly the, the details about... Um, and Zio Boucher uh, having some new age beliefs and feeling like Joseph Smith and um, Christ were ascended masters. Um, oh, there was another, there was another post that somebody had um, put on Reddit too uh, regarding this where somebody's mother uh, was in the mission where Boucher was the mission president and said that he had kind of gone crazy with spiritualist beliefs or something. Um, I don't know if it was like a mission reunion or something, but somewhere after the fact that this Redditor's mother had heard of Boucher's uh, beliefs. So anyway, I find that fascinating. I don't know much about Grant Palmer. I haven't read his books, um, but it's interesting that the, this kind of highlights this, again, this false dichotomy of like the church being true or all spiritual things being false and, and the, the swing towards atheism and you know, materialism that most people leaving the church go to. Um, and it's interesting that Grant and other ex-Mormons wanted there to be this general authority that... Uh, fit that mold of feeling that, that the church was f false and corrupt. Um, when in actuality, this person had a fairly nuanced belief, um, about, I guess, m you know, believed a lot of esoteric things, which is, I think this kind of middle ground or this recontextualization of Mormonism as 
um, just another flavor of esoteric beliefs. And so I found that very fascinating that there was a general authority that appears to have had um, very bizarre beliefs, at least bizarre by the standards of an ex-Mormon who had left the church and was probably um, in the camp that they felt like everything was a fraud and, and made up. Um, I couldn't find any, any more information about um, Enzio Boucher. I had never, I don't think I'd heard of him, um, but apparently had given some pretty powerful speeches. Somebody had reached out to me, I think recently, and I was chatting with them about this and they're like, oh, he, he gave one of my favorite uh, speeches, one of these BYU um, speeches. So yeah, I'm curious how many other general authorities um, have kind of evolving uh, beliefs or more esoteric beliefs. I think it's an interesting discussion of what the uh, apostles and Quorum of the 12, the, the 15, I guess, believe. I know some people are take this quite to an extreme and, and believe that they know that it's not true. And I even know people that are convinced that they're involved in ritual abuse. Um, I think I've never really, I mean, I've known a lot of people that, um, and personally myself, you know, there was a lot of like faking it till you make it and trying to convince yourself that you believe things and, and reading and then praying about the book more and being like, well, I didn't really get an answer, but I felt kind of peaceful when I prayed. Um, and I, that my, my guess would be that, that the first presidency and the quorum of the 12 probably, um, probably very conflicted in their beliefs. Like I, I imagine there's a significant part of kind of their subconscious or, or part of them that has doubts. Um, but that they're also just so committed. And, and when you have, when you're faced with those doubts, it's, you know, psychologically, it's, it's really common for people to double down and, and to really, um, look for anything that they can find that confirms that belief. And, and sometimes you have to look for, um, you know, looking for people that are attacking the church, um, is a good way to, to help feed that narrative of like, well, you know, if there were, if it wasn't true, there wouldn't be this opposition. Um, but I also think that it's, it's undoubtedly true that many people in the church have had very spiritual, um, even mystical experiences. And I think that's one thing that is most often discounted by those that leave the church, um, is that they, I think either because they haven't had many spiritual or, or you know, mystical, even like endogenous kind of psychedelic experiences in the church, um, themselves, which, which that would, I would fit that class. I mean, I really did not have many spiritual experiences in the church. I think mean, one time I lost my wallet and I prayed and it was like right there after I prayed, that was actually like pretty bizarre and, and cool. Um, but even then I tried to, um, logically say, ah, oh, it could have been in the, the jacket that, but I mean, some people share really, um, really bizarre experiences. Um, and I think that, yeah, if you haven't had those experiences in the church, um, and those experiences can be, um, experienced by people because they, some people are just much more predisposed to it. And in our, in our episode that we talked about, um, my experiences in that journal article that talked about spontaneous spiritual awakenings and Kundalini awakenings. I mean, they showed that people that are more prone to having those endogenous psychedelic experiences, you know, mystical spiritual experiences, um, they had more right temporal lobe, I believe, um, activity. So some people, just the way their brain is wired, they're, they're much, much more able to and susceptible to 
um, have these experiences, you know, guided meditations are really able to drop into these states. Um, others, my, myself included, just really um, have a hard time. I'm not that creative in that way. So some people are just more predisposed to it, but particularly, you know, um, fasting or really, you know, meditation, you know, some people's, the way they pray is much more contemplative than maybe the, the road fashion that, um, others do in the church. So some people are predisposed to it. Other people are doing things that, you know, religious activities that will commonly, um, can, can bring about these experiences. So, so I think some people dismiss them because they haven't had them. Other people, you know, I think have had some experiences that when they leave the church, it's, it is hard to, that's one thing people discuss is like, well, how do you recontextualize, um, those experiences that you had? Um, because you, you want everything to fit into a neat box, just like when you were in the church, you wanted everything to, to fit, um, in a box and the, the shelf items were difficult. And so when you, when you're leaving the church, you, you don't want to have a shelf anymore. And so a lot of people dismiss those as elevation emotions, um, which I think there is some truth to that. Just, you know, being in a quiet temple, that's beautiful. Like it'll give you a peaceful feeling, but, but there definitely is, um, phenomena that are, are actual mystical experiences. That's what the research is showing, um, both into, um, spontaneous experiences, but, but certainly psychedelic experiences. And so, so yeah, and that's a long way to say that, um, it could be very possible that apostles, prophets have had experiences where they've experienced Christ coming to them and, um, ministering to them, you know, whether it's a, a dream or, or whether it is actual an experience of their reality, rendering that for them. Um, I think that's, that's possible. I mean, I think when you hear, I listened to Denver snuffer on Mormon book reviews, talking to, um, talking to the host of Mormon book reviews. And he was talking about his experiences with, I think an angel and then Christ. And he was saying, you know, I, you know, I, he was cagey about, um, or, or, um, hesitant to, to say too much. Cause he was, he said that, you know, he didn't want to cast his pearls before swine and that people would make fun of it. Um, but he, he said that, you know, it was a physical manifestation of, of Christ, um, that like he felt him. And then one of his other experiences, I think one of his first experiences when he, and I don't know a lot about Denver snuffer, um, but when he was taken somewhere by the angel, uh, or messenger, whatever that came to him, the host was asking, was like, so were you in the same place or were you somewhere else? And, um, and, and like, if somebody was watching you in that room, would they see the angel or not? And Denver, uh, was like, you know, I don't know. He didn't know. And, and so, yeah, th there's something obviously that's going on and it's the same phenomenon, same category of phenomenon that people have, you know, when they're talking about a lot of these alien abductions or, or UFO, UAP uh, encounters. Um, and so I think that's something that needs to be considered and, and validate as, as experiences that people are having and that there's a way that they really believe they had and really did experiencing, uh, experience that. Um, and, and again, this all makes sense if, in other episodes, if you consider the philosophical, um, perspective of idealism and the fact that, you know, we're rendering reality as kind of dissociated parts, uh, dissociated consciousnesses of a kind of meta consciousness, um, somewhat akin to a dream where, you know, your alter or your, your, uh, little dream avatar is experiencing a world is experiencing others that are actually coming from the same, uh, meta consciousness, uh, even though it seems very real, it's physical matter, it's, um, space, it's time, it is all rendered through consciousness, you know, so there, there are ways to discuss this and, and integrate this and examine this without telling these people, oh, that's made up in your head. 
um, or it's a hallucination. Um, but yeah, so I don't, you know, in terms of the, or the 12 apostles, first presidency, I don't know, you know, I'm not, I think they genuinely are trying to do the right thing. I think that they, um, probably, you know, they, they do seem to express some of this kind of victim or, or persecuted complex that I think has been part of the ego of the church, um, from the beginning, um, understandably so, you know, that's the, the perspective that I think Joseph Smith's family had, um, from their situations and just for everything that went on. So I think that's been part of the persona of the church and continues to, um, live today within the leadership of the church. But I think they're, you know, likely trying, likely believe to the most part that things are true, but they also probably have parts of themselves that they may not. So anyway, I went on a little bit there at the end, but so that's just some interesting things about a general authority that Grant Palmer had claimed was an informant, but it, it seems, um, a non-believing informant, but the truth seems to be closer to th that it was a general authority that had some esoteric, not orthodox beliefs. Um, and so wanted to share that because I found that fascinating and I hadn't seen anybody else that had kind of tied this together to, I guess, you know, in this podcast, we've presented a narrative where, um, I think all those new age beliefs, um, have a lot of merit, maybe not necessarily held literally, um, but there's a, there's a reason that they keep popping up through esoteric traditions over time. So anyway, thanks for joining me. Um, I'll try to be more regular in posting, uh, recording and posting episodes and get some more guests on. Um, I always forget to say this, but it, if you're new here and you're curious about what the overall narrative is and, and how science and spirituality, you know, integrate and kind of a non dichotomous black and white narrative on the history of the church and where the book of Mormon came from. Um, episode two would be the one to look at. It's essentially just kind of discussing how, you know, Joseph Smith likely experienced some spiritual metaphysical things um and that it's the most likely conclusion to me is is not that he made up everything but that he actually believed many of these things um and um and that there are many esoteric themes and i think actually the what i would say the most beautiful or fascinating or enriching themes within Mormonism, eternal progression, you know, eternal marriage, um, kind of the universalist view of, you know, work for the dead, I mean, genealogy. I mean, these are actually all themes that, um, the most beautiful aspects of Mormonism and, the, and somewhat unique aspects of Mormonism actually overlap heavily with esoteric traditions and new age philosophy. So episode two would be the one to listen to, to hear that. And yeah, thanks for joining me. Hope everybody had a good Christmas and I'll try to get back with some more episodes soon. Thanks. Um...